Union Armour Conference. Uh, we have uh, over 200 registered participants from a number of countries around the world. Uh, we have about 100 who have joined us right now, and uh, they're still joining in. We are grateful to Tracy Kuto, uh, Ignited, and their staff at Lemoyne University for coordinating the registrations and providing a facilitating space for the conference. Just for your information and for those who join in late, the panels today and tomorrow will be recorded and we will be made available for distribution later. Also, all of you should have access to a shared folder which has all the relevant information and which we will keep updating. One item of housekeeping, unless you are the speaker, kindly keep yourself muted. If you have any questions, post these in the chat. My name is Nikki Santos and I'm the president of the Colleagues of Jesuit Business Education. This conference is co-hosted by the International Association of Jesuit Universities, the International Association of Jesuit Business Schools, the Colleagues of Jesuit Business Education in collaboration with the International Humanistic Management Association. I welcomed you on behalf of the CJB. Let me ask the representatives of the other organizations to unmute themselves and welcome you. After the welcomes, Father Garanzini will lead us in an opening prayer. So David. Thank you, Father Nikki. Uh, my name is David Mayorga, and I, on behalf of the International Association of Jesuit Business Schools, I am very pleased to welcome you to this virtual conference, New Paradigm for New Normal. We're very interested to know more about the impact of the new paradigm on the business schools and to share experiences to apply new perspectives in our universities. I am sure we will take new ideas and proposals from the conference and workshops that are part of this important event. Have a very good conference these days and all the best for you and thank you again for your participation. Thanks. Thank you. Michael, yes sir. Yeah, welcome all. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's wonderful to see you and, and, and looking uh, forward to interesting conversations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. In the name of the uh, International Association of Jesuit Universities, uh, it's, I'm very, very pleased, very proud to be part of this and uh, really grateful to the um, International Association of Jesuit Business Schools because you've been the leaders in this movement and uh, I think uh, thinking ahead to the kind of world we want to, we want to create and help our students to form. So I really appreciate this opportunity to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you. For the Garden City, can you lead us in an opening prayer? Sure, sure. Uh, I take this from um, the opening paragraphs of The Vocation of the Business Leader, which was published by the Pontifical Council on Justice and Peace. And you know, the University of St. Thomas Business School had a great part, large part in that report. Um, so, so this is inspired from that report. In the gospel, we read that Jesus taught us, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Business people have been given resources and the Lord asks them for many great things. This is the vocation of a business person. Eternal and merciful God, businessmen and women have contributed marvelous innovations that have cured diseases, brought people closer together through technology, and created prosperity in countless ways. At the same time, we have seen some scandals and some serious economic disturbances and an erosion of trust in business organizations and in free market institutions generally. For men and women of faith, this is a time that calls for examination of our accomplishments and of our shortcomings and failures as well. Too many on our globe are still unable to achieve a decent standard of living and too many fall outside the circle of those with secure sources of health care, food and shelter, a decent wage, and opportunities for their children. We ask today that we might prepare ourselves to educate a new generation of business leaders who are sensitive to these issues, who hunger for a more just distribution of the wealth of our communities, and who manage their businesses 
with care for the lowest wage earner just as much as they care for their fellow executives and owners. We ask for guidance and for courage to reimagine how we will lead young people to build communities and governments that reflect a concern for the integral human development of all. Our prayer today is that all our faculty, staff, students, and alumni will become more and more instruments of cultural engagement and promoters of justice and peace. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father Garanzini. Let me briefly introduce our first uh, panelist, uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, Dr. Sachs is a world-renowned professor of economics, widely considered to be one of the world's leading experts on economic development, global macroeconomics, and the fight against poverty. His work on ending poverty, overcoming macroeconomic instability, promoting economic growth, fighting hunger and disease, and promoting sustainable environmental practices has taken him to more than 125 countries. Over the past 30 years, he has advised dozens of heads of state and governments on economic strategy in the Americas, Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. He was among the outside advisors to Pope John Paul II on the encyclical Centesimus Annus and currently works closely with the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences on issues of sustainable development. So without further ado, I hand it over to Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you so much. Uh, what a great honor and pleasure to be with you. And thank you for the important work that you are leading uh, in rethinking the uh, curriculum for economics, uh, finance, and business uh, at uh, the Jesuit business schools, and I hope for business schools and economics departments uh, around the world. We are clearly in a, an extraordinarily deep uh, crisis globally. Uh, we were in a deep crisis even before COVID-19, but the world has been turned upside down uh, just in recent months uh, with the addition of the pandemic to all of the other phenomenal stresses, unprecedented uh, stresses uh, and disruptions that we're experiencing. We are in the midst of a health crisis, uh, obviously with more than 600,000 uh, deaths from this disease, uh, more than uh, 12 million infections uh, confirmed, many more unconfirmed, and the disease spreading rapidly. At the same time, we are facing ecological shocks that uh, we have not faced before and that are caused by human activity, pollution, uh, destruction of rainforests, uh, destruction of habitat, and of course, uh, human-induced climate change. Uh, at the same time, our economy had already become profoundly unequal uh, before COVID, but what's happening in recent months simply uh, is beyond uh, our imagination. We have uh, hundreds of millions of people who have lost livelihoods and the stock markets are booming. This is uh, something that is uh, absolutely uh, unimaginable. Uh, Jeffrey Bezos, the uh, founder of Amazon, has seen in this year, not uh, <laughs> over the whole course of time, but in this year, since the start of the pandemic, a $70 billion rise of personal wealth at a time that we are in a Great Depression in the United States with mass unemployment. We have anomalies everywhere. Uh, one of the new medicines uh, that uh, provides some hope for treating COVID-19, remdesivir, uh, is a 
drug that was developed with taxpayer money, the National Institutes of Health, uh, and yet it is uh, with the patent rights exclusively of one private company, Gilead, which is charging $3,000 for a course of medicines that cost $9 to produce. We've lost our bearings. We don't even have a culture of life in the United States right now with a uh, more than 130,000 deaths and an inability to have a national response to a killer pandemic. Well, in my view, this reflects two fundamental issues. Uh, maybe I would say three fundamental issues to, to be more precise. One is that we face a complexity that is extraordinary and uh, therefore we need an understanding of these phenomena that are deeper than uh, what we have had and understood in the past. Uh, and clearly many of our leaders are not up to that understanding. Second, and this is uh, quite obvious, any fairy tale about uh, the invisible hand of the marketplace uh, as uh, solving these problems is uh, extraordinarily off base. We need shared action. We need government and civil society to overcome profound deficiencies of the marketplace, which is geared towards profit, but not towards well being, which is geared actually towards environmental destruction, not environmental stewardship which uh, creates gaps of wealth and poverty that are beyond imagination uh, with the, as I mentioned, Jeffrey Bezos's net worth today, $184 billion, one person, and yet people starving around the world. And this is viewed as somehow normal. So the second point is the market system by itself could never address the challenges that we face. A market cannot end a pandemic. A market cannot stop the massive inequalities of wealth. A market will not protect the environment. This is something that uh, human insight through collective action of a government oriented toward the common good and of civil society must take on more than the forces of the marketplace. So this leads me to the third point, and that is our crisis is clearly a crisis of ethics, uh, fundamentally a crisis of ethics. Pope Francis, I think, has put it best by saying that we have a globalization of indifference or an idolatry of money and the marketplace. And this is now literally killing us. We just don't understand the common good. And our students that we teach are not taught about the common good. And they're not taught about uh, the social responsibility. And so if one looks at the horrifying comment pages uh, in uh, the websites of the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, what is revealed in the comment sections is that we are lost right now, wandering aimlessly as a society in part because we don't even have a common orientation to what we're after. Even the most basic orientation of saving lives is something that is beyond our consensus at this moment. So we face complexity, 
We face a need to harness government and civil society alongside markets. And we lack an orientation to the good. In my view, for us to confront the economic challenges that we face, we need to be teaching all three of these dimensions of our current existential crisis. The complexities of an environmental crisis interwoven with an inequality crisis, interwoven with uh, a uh, profound uh, public health crisis. We need to understand in the second dimension how public policy works, the limits of the marketplace, why markets can't solve a pandemic, why they can't stop climate change, uh, why it is therefore incumbent on society to address these issues through other instrumentalities, including government. And third, we need an ethics. An ethics fundamentally is an orientation to the good. This is what ethics means. Uh, ethics means living our lives to achieve the good. And for that, we need an understanding of the good. It starts with human dignity. It starts with care for life. It starts with human rights of each person to that human dignity and to the economic and social means for that dignity. It understands that this is achieved through virtue and the virtues uh, that we know of uh, prudence, courage, temperance, justice, faith, hope, and charity are the virtues that we need in our world. And it also understands in ethics that these virtues apply at the individual level, that we must be challenged ourselves as individuals, and they apply at the organizational level. In other words, we need governments that are virtuous. It's not an accident that when Aristotle wrote the Nicomachean Ethics, he wrote alongside it the politics, because these are two books that are both about the good. One is the good of the individual, directed to his son Nicomachus, and the other is to the good of the society which Aristotle notes comes even before the individual because we are social animals. And so these books come together. We need an ethics of the organization, of government and of companies, as well as an ethics of individual behavior and responsibility. So my view is that we need a new economic ethics and a new business ethics that reflect these fundamental realities. And I think that even the most uh, uh, capitalist uh, of uh, our business community, the Business Roundtable, understood in the past year that their old doctrine that it's all about wealth is no longer acceptable. They said that a corporation needs an ethics towards all its stakeholders, not just towards its shareholders. Uh, this is a reversal for the business roundtable. I don't think it's a very deep reversal yet, because I'm afraid that the CEOs today of our companies were trained in a different kind of ethics, which is to make money at any cost. They weren't trained in a proper social ethics. So my view is that we can rebase economics, finance, and uh, business training with a ethical foundation that reflects the realities that we face. And I take the church's social teachings to be uh, exemplary in this regard. Uh, 
they are not in any way contradictory to what we would teach students about how markets work or how businesses work, but they say that markets and business must operate according to an ethics. That means oriented towards the good. And that means understanding what the good is. And that means understanding the limits of self-regarding behavior, which is the first point of the good, that it's not all egoism, it's not all profit maximization, it's not all desire maximization. Uh, it's uh, a proper balance. And this needs to be reformulated and retaught. I think starting uh, with the church's social teachings is uh, a profoundly uh, beneficial way to do this. Uh, to my mind, uh, they are, of course, through Thomism, the, the great synthesis of the wisdom of uh, philosophy and, uh, and the church's uh, uh, teachings, uh, uh, theological teachings. But the synthesis uh, is something that extends beyond the church. It's about the orientation towards the good in society in general. I uh, myself have been trying to uh, rethink how economics could be taught in this regard. I'm an economist, not a business uh, professor or, or finance professor. So I think about what we teach in economics right now about maximizing utility and how naive that is, uh, as opposed to the idea of pursuing the good and how different it would be to tell our students what it means to think about the good, because we wouldn't be maximizing utility, we would be moderating our desires. That's a quite different uh, kind of uh, approach to human life, which has uh, a much higher merit. <laughs> In fact, uh, we would be discussing our innate sociality. Uh, we would be discussing our responsibilities to others we would be discussing not how the prisoner's dilemma leads us to cheat, but how our social uh, being leads us to cooperate and how we can foster that cooperation. In other words, it would be a very different curriculum, uh, but it would still teach some of the same principles, and yet it would teach with the orientation towards the good, the good at the individual level, the good at the societal level, and addressing the crises that we face. Uh, I'll just end by saying that Laudato Si is a text for such a curriculum, uh, because it is a text about climate change that is scientifically grounded, about environmental stewardship that is ecologically grounded, but it shows how one can orient the uh, response to this crisis through uh, a profound moral framework uh, and how that leads us, uh, as uh, Pope Francis says, uh, to the very need for a common plan for our one home. It calls for global cooperation. Uh, it calls for a new kind of business orientation. And so this is the kind of text that I think provides the basis for the new curriculum. I want to thank you for leading this effort. I think it will have profound significance. And to reiterate, as I uh, always uh, will do, that uh, I'm at your disposal in any way. Thank you very much for letting me uh, join this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sachs. Uh, would you have time for one or two questions? Of course. I, I know you have to leave. Uh, so there was one uh, question from the audience is, uh, how, do, you know, how do you move business and commerce towards an ethics and orientation to the common good in democracies where voter preference prevails? Does business lead voters or is business following voter preferences? I think uh, people everywhere seek the good, I think this is an ancient point, uh, but I think it's the one that we need to uh, re-inspire. We have been taught, especially in the American cultural context, 
uh, just about the American dream or go make money. Uh, and uh, I think uh, our society has come up very short at this point. Uh, it is not, in my view, an accident that we are among the worst performers in fighting the pandemic because we do not have a culture oriented towards saving lives right now. Uh, and uh, I don't see our business leaders, by the way, speaking out uh, about this. Uh, some of our business leaders have uh, spoken out about the need to open the economy at any cost and so forth, not how they can help uh, contain this pandemic. So I view our country as being in a moral crisis, but I think that it is a moral crisis that the public feels as a crisis, not as a source of contentment. So the idea of reinvoking a language of the common good, uh, reinvoking uh, training in ethics, it's not a simple issue uh, of uh, how uh, this is <coughs> going to be solved. It's an ancient notion that uh, a virtuous government helps to, uh, to promote virtue in the citizens and in business. Uh, and uh, when government lacks virtue, uh, the society lacks virtue. And when the society is uh, without uh, virtue, uh, it gets a government, uh, I won't say that it deserves, but it gets a government that reflects the, the lack of uh, virtue. Well, I will say we've never had a less virtuous government than under Trump. Uh, I don't mean to make a political point, I mean to make a practical point. We are in the hands of sociopathy right now. And that is a moral uh, point that is uh, absolutely astounding. This man does not care about the deaths of tens of thousands of Americans. It is a fact. It is not a, a partisan statement. And so this is uh, why we're so disoriented right now. Uh, but there's a hunger for a proper orientation. And I know among our students, there's a deep hunger, but in an economics department right now, students are not taught at all about the good, what it is. They're not even asked to explore it. They're asked to maximize the utility function. That's a quite different thing. Uh, so in this sense, uh, I don't think that there's a simple answer, Michael, to this question, uh, because our business people are operating in an amoral or immoral environment right now. Uh, and they don't know the difference of making money and doing the right thing necessarily in many cases. Uh, I will say, uh, just uh, I'll give one final point, uh, however, proceeding immorally, for example, as uh, the oil industry has done for years, uh, and this is something Pope Francis uh, said directly to the executives of the oil industry. He warned them that the science and the ethics says that the oil has to be kept under the ground. Well, they didn't, they didn't want to hear it, and they didn't believe it. So they invested uh, vast sums in the last 10 years in this industry, and now they're going bankrupt. And so I don't think that there is the long-term reward in business for behaving badly, but there is the short-term temptation. And this, I think, is uh, part of this paradox. Uh, and it's part of what a good education can show that we do, I think, <laughs> we on, on the line believe that there is a, a reward to good behavior. <laughs> Uh, and uh, this applies in business as well, but not necessarily synchronized in the short term. So businesses that willfully violate the public good, and there are many of them, uh, in the end, I think pay a very profound price. But uh, often they make a lot of money before they pay that profound price, and, and that, that is part of our challenge. Thank you, Professor Sachs. Uh, 
I, I just one more one more question and kind of then I'll, I'll let you go. Um, so you did mention, you know, that the role of the university and our business schools is kind of teaching uh, our students the common good. And uh, there was a question from the audience which said, uh, you know, how do we attract students to take courses that focus on uh, the common good when they are so concerned about, especially in countries like the United States, about student debt and taking courses that will help them to get a good job to help them pay off that student debt? Oh, the questions are not easy. Uh, you know, uh, we're the only rich country uh, that puts debts on our young people. So uh, I think this is partly a political answer in Canada, uh, in uh, continental Europe. There aren't student debts this way. We have $1.6 trillion of student debts. Uh, even the universities sell their debts now to debt collectors, uh, putting their students at the mercy of uh, these uh, really rapacious uh, and vicious organizations. Um, so I'm against this kind of financing of higher education. I believe in a much larger role of uh, the state and, uh, and uh, federal government to help pay for education, uh, especially uh, at uh, the college level. Uh, it is often the case at business schools that uh, the returns will be sufficiently high that somehow financing can be achieved. But even then, there are you know cases. I don't believe in us uh, piling on 1.6 trillion dollars of debt in the United States. At the same time, I think it is beyond the question just of student debts. Many of our students think or are told well, you're going to come here and then you're going to go make money. That's your purpose. And that, I think, is where we can intervene uh, and uh, explain something better about purpose uh, and open up the thinking about purpose. And I do think that it is uh, the teachings of the church and the teachings of philosophy and the teachings of history that people don't know these right choices by themselves. Uh, the whole idea of the good and uh, the wisdom to choose the good, phronesis, uh, as uh, the uh, Greeks called it, is not something that uh, is uh, easy, and it's not something that is second nature. It's something that has to be cultivated. And so we take a hands-off attitude, uh, especially in economics. Oh, people have their taste. Don't interfere. That's not your business. But that's not at all the 2,000 years of our ethical teaching. Our ethical teaching is people need guidance. Students need guidance. We each need guidance. I believe that very much. I believe that uh, helping people to live a good life is our responsibility as teachers. Uh, and so uh, I don't want to simplify the question of student debts, but I do want to say to students, it is not right that you should be here to figure out how you're going to make the most money because that is not going to be the best life for you. Uh, and it's not going to be the best life for society. And they'll say, well, why is that? Why should I be poor? And then we can enter into a good discussion about what is a good life and not to presume that uh, an 18 year old, even I'll say 65 year old has a ready answer to that question. Uh, but it's one that uh, is what philosophical reflection is actually all about. Thank you, Professor Saxon. Thank you for spending time with us. If you, uh, we have a, a couple pleasure. of questions which we'll circle back to you, but thank you for uh, your wisdom. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. We'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be talking soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. With, with that, let me, let me introduce uh, our next uh, panelist. Father Gusto Zampini Davis. Uh, Father Zampini is an Argentine uh, priest from the Diocese of San Isidro Buenos Aires. Before entering the priesthood, Father Zampini worked as a lawyer at the Central Bank of Argentina and the international law firm Baker and McKenzie. His area of expertise is moral theology with a focus on economics and environmental ethics and he has been lecturing at various universities around the world since 2004. 
In 2018, Pope Francis appointed him as one of the experts or advisors to the Synod of the Amazon, and in April 2020, as the adjunct secretary of the Vatican Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. Father Zampini is currently leading the Vatican's post-COVID-19 task force. Uh, Father Zampini? Thank you very much, uh, Father Santos, uh, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Michael Carancini, uh, also for all the work, Michael Pearson, uh, Jeff, for your wonderful words. Um, I apologize, I'm not wearing a suit, but um, the air conditioning is not working. And here in Rome, we have almost 30 degrees, so <laughs> I hope you will understand. <laughs> um, just to, um, I would like to share a PowerPoint if that's okay. Yes, that's possible. Um, so, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So, um, so, can you see now? A screen? Yeah, so this is what I want to share with you. Uh, uh, some bittersweet news, but here we are. So the Pope Francis, the other day, we, after like three months of working very, very hard in the Vatican COVID Commission, and so uh, um, we were with Cardinal Jackson, Monsignor Dufe, that we, we are leading this, and, and we asked him, well, how can we define in one sentence the Vatican Commission? And he has, he's brilliant, no? he, so it's not just one sentence, it's three words. So he said, prepare the future. So prepare the future is different from preparing for the future. Uh, preparing for the future means that our, our future is set, uh, our destiny is set. We have to start buying life um, safe jackets, those who can afford it. Uh, whereas preparing the future means that we can be agents of our own destiny, like Paul VI used to say, uh, that we can design something different, something new, uh, particularly now that we have, we don't have any option but to design something new. And that, that something new includes economics. Not, it's not just economics, but includes economics. So prepare the future. We can prepare the future, which is exactly what also educators do. So that's why I wanted to start with, with this slide, uh, to bring an element of, of hope and particularly of mission. Uh, I mean, on top of what um, Father Garanzini was mentioning about that, that prayer, no? or, or being, this is our vocation. This is not just something that, that we do for money. I mean, teaching economics or working in economics is a, is a vocation to prepare the future, not just for the future. And what does it mean that? Uh, well, in economic terms, a long time ago, in 2013, Pope Francis sa uh, said, well, in terms of economics, no to an economy of exclusion, no to the new idolatry of money, because it's always renewed, this idolatry, no to a financial system which rules rather than serves. We're still here, like Jeff uh, Satch explained. <laughs> no? The financial industry is doing wonderful while all the economic, the real economy is collapsing. No to the inequality which spawns violence. We are, again, COVID-19 has highlighted this inequality, digital inequality. We are very lucky to, to work uh, here through our systems, but all the ones who can't. So look at what Pope Francis said in 2013, we are even worse than that. And to put it into the words of a brilliant economist, in my, my opinion, which is Kate Roworth from um, the Oxford University, you know, and the Donuts Economics. She described it that, look at what, what's happening now. We have a financial meltdown, and I would say, I would add an economic meltdown, not just financial. We have a climate breakdown, and we have a COVID lockdown with all the three, guess who is the most affected? The poor. <laughs> so we clearly don't want this. And then the, the, the thing that, that, that Jeff was saying before is very important because to deny that that is happening is what in Spanish we call negacionismo, which is denialism. So we can, we, we as, as Christians, if we want to include economics and ethics and prepare the future, we cannot deny the truth if we want to prepare something new. And to deny that we have an economic uh, meltdown, uh, a climate breakdown and a COVID and a health lockdown is to, deny, is to deny the truth. Like some even politicians are saying that the virus doesn't exist, 
they say that pollution doesn't exist, that the, plan, the planet boundaries doesn't exist, but the planet boundaries don't exist. But this is, this is as, in, in, uh, as Amartya Sen used to say in terms of economics, uh, Nobel Prize in economics, this is rational fullness, you see, <laughs> to deny the truth, because the only thing that we can change the truth is to accept it. Now, what have been, after a couple of months of working in the COVID commission, this is what we want. We have to take, the pandemic is terrible. As Jeff was saying, thousands of people have died, millions have been infected, millions have lost their jobs, millions of children are, cannot go to school, they, cannot, they don't have access to the, to, the meal, to the daily meal in many parts of the world. Domestic violence has rocketed, and, and you name it. I mean, the, the food supply chain is disrupted, uh, uncertainty is in the rise, uh, geopol geopolitics is very, the, the conflicts are rising. So this is really, really a tragedy. I, I'm not praising COVID-19. But why don't we use it as an opportunity, as an occasion, to rebuild our relationships based on the common good? And basically, to start with, to promote a new universal solidarity. This is what Laudato Si says, or Francis in Laudato Si says, a new universal solidarity, not the ones that we have, the, sol the principle of solidarity remains, but we need to reimagine this universal solidarity, starting from the last. But we need to do it in parallel uh, of restoring harmony with the environment, because if we don't, we will have COVID-20, COVID-21, COVID-22, or tsunami 47, 48, 49, or, or the rest, with enormous economic consequences. And, but the conversion to promote universal solidarity or restore harmony with the environment, the, the driver for that is not going to be because professors in economics show, so they show a chart, a flip chart, or because the UN tell us, or even because priests tell us. It will come if we are moved, if we are touched in our hearts. This is, this is a spiritual strength. And look at what happened with COVID. When politicians have uh, the, the approval of people because they understand that this is their, their, their health is at risk, they, they can shut down countries. It's incredible. So change is possible, but we have to do it. How can we promote a good change, sustainable? That comes from the spirit. So, so if we can merge the teaching of economics with our spiritual tradition, that's explosive. Because what we want is the well-being as uh, as uh, Jeffrey Satch was saying, but to have healthy people health, with healthy institutions and a healthy planet. Now, in the commission, we have divided this into five groups and we are inviting different people to the conversation because we are only a catalyst. Uh, but we want to enable long-term change. And, uh, and I will skip that, but long-term change, it, it is it related to the education. But what are the core principles that must, in our opinion, must be considered for example, in, with the economic uh, recovery plans that most countries are having at the moment, without any single criteria, believe me, uh, we are part of different fora and th there's no criteria, that there's clearly a, a lack of ethics when we have to so-called recover the economy, that we don't like the word that, but I will come to that later. So first of all is to neutralize the dichotomies. What do, what do they mean? A false dichotomy between economic growth and the care of, and our health. Do so you see health or economics? Well, wh how, who is saying that we can have a healthy economy with sick people? I mean, just to think about that is, is completely rational. Who, I mean, the same, we recover the, the, the market or we, shall we care for the environment? Well, what kind of market do we want to have if we are going to destroy the source of the market, which is our our nature. No? Just that these are false dichotomies that we have to neutralize starting from the beginning, from when you learn how to, how to promote economic growth, how to measure it, how to analyze it, how to have a business, how to administrate it, how to create financial tools, etc. The second thing that we want to neutralize, uh, that we want to do is to push a little bit for the two key principles that are the human dignity and the common good, that are Two sides of the coins, two, two sides of one coin. So as you know, in many countries, human dignity, my right, my human right, my individual freedom is, is the main principle. Well, I, I mean, yes and no, because we are 
human beings, we are individuals in relation, we are persons in relation. We, we don't exist in a vacuum. So we, we, the individual rights are always connected with a collective life. And vice versa, the common good, well, in the name of a common good, we cannot destroy individual lives, no? as others are saying. But the, the Catholic social teaching has always put this in tension. The, the individuals will live in a community. Therefore, we have to understand that all our freedoms, our uh, economic mechanisms should be designed thinking in the common and thinking in the individual in parallel. Now, they're not opposites, the state or the market. Well, now we are seeing with the COVID, and I, I, and a parenthesis and a, and a joke up to, um, so when we were discussing about the COVID, um, a friend of mine said, well, we, uh, I thought that the COVID was going to uh, help people to convert, not the, the atheists that don't believe in God, to convert into God because so many people are dying. But we believe that all the ultra libertarians, no, the neoliberals, as we call, they're all converted into Keynesians because now they all accept that the, 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 you know, the, the countries they have to rescue companies. <laughs> so you see, so this is, this is the, they are all converted to, neo to Keynesians. So, but what's happening? Why is a false dichotomy? Because we are individuals in relations. We live in a, in a, um, in a, um, uh, in a, in a community. So it's very important, the principle of the common good, to include it, as Jeffrey Satch was saying, also in the curricula. So, but we don't want to recover the economy. We, we, if, we, if we have to recover, is something that kills, something that generates inequality, something that destroys the planet, that biodiversity, that, don't res that doesn't respect the planetary boundaries. Well, why, why should we recover that? Why don't we regenerate? So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a more natural word to generate something new based on what we have, of course. Why don't we use this opportunity to regenerate something new? The economy. Uh, and again, and with two other principles that are also two sides of the coin, sub, sol, sub, solidarity that I mentioned before with subsidiarity. So this is the, again, why should I rescue something? Why should I, uh, if, that, if that, those persons, they don't rescue their own, their own employees? Why should I rescue a company that is, is firing all their employees? Or why should I rescue a company? I'm giving a concrete example. So I don't want to mention companies, but instead of, if, if you're recording it, but here in Italy, it happened. Why should I rescue a company that has it, uh, its savings in tax heaven? But it, it's insane. So I'm using public money to rescue a company that, that, don't, that doesn't want to pay taxes. So you see, <laughs> so the subsidiarity and solidarity needs to be together. And also, why should I rescue a company that's polluting? Why don't you, I put money and subsidies in, new, in companies that can create new jobs that are sustainable and et cetera? And the last thing that we want to do is to, as most of you, I'm sure you would agree, to monitor growth in a different way, according to societal goals. No? Who says that growth, 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 mathematical growth is what we need? Who says that? If we are, I mean, where, where does it come from? That's not a natural law. That's something that we can change. Whereas this, the, the, the ecosystems, we cannot change once we destroy them. Um, death, we cannot change. We cannot change when people are dead or when people are extremely uh, un unhealthy, etc. So this is what we want to instill in concrete economics today, in political economics, but also in the in the teachings. Um, I'm skipping this, and we we came out with four pillars of focus that we want to work. That doesn't mean that all others are not important. No, there, but at least what we discover is we have so the material that we have is enormous and we need at least four or five pillars the most to focus and then we can have subgroups that we are going to work at least for one year but look at the pillars what I, why i'm sharing this with you because they are all with some principles that we can think about also in including the, in the curricula work and the jobs of the future today today we have millions of people losing their jobs not tomorrow so let us create today something new and, and promote jobs or the jobs of the future rather than creating the jobs that we know that sooner or later we have to change secondly from uh, from one to many new structures for the common good now this is very important the understanding of what i was saying we, from one to many we live in a society 
So we have to create societies, systems, financial tools that serve the common good and not destroy the common good, or not just serve one individual or some. Thirdly, we cannot fight a pandemic or inequality or climate change, or you mentioned, without proper governance. Without proper governance, we have is 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 the law of of is the is the, the law of niche, no? Is, is the the one who has who is more powerful uh, prevails. So in order to promote peace, we need good good governance uh, as a, as a as a stability for security, no? And this is at the heart of the new universal solidarity that we want to promote. So it's connected with governments, political economics, and jobs, etc. And the and the last one is rebalancing social systems with nature in the wake of COVID nineteen. We cannot, again, ignore our relationship with nature, as Lao Tse says. So Lao Tse, again, I will agree with, with, with Jeffrey Sachs, it's, can, it's a good basis to think in new uh, systems and in new teachings and new curriculums. And here are some sub-themes sub -themes that we can think about. We are going to work, and all of you who wants to work, you're more than welcome. Dignity in work and the jobs of the future today, it's related to the new Green Deal that is being discussed in Europe, in America, well, I don't know how long uh, would you go, or how far would you go on this? But again, it's fighting again the digital uh, divide, it's promoting the digital transition against the technocratic paradigm that thinks that technology could, could solve everything. The, the, the new structures for the common good, from one to many, is this new public and private relations I was mentioning? Is new principles for global trade and use the new technology for global trade, trade for example, uh, and, and a political economy of debt relief, restructuring finance to improve resilience. So finance could be a source of good if it is aligned with the goals of society, which are the Sustainable Development Goals that more than 190 countries uh, voted. So, but if finance are completely detached from the goals of society, they are not source of good. So. Uh, then in the in the governance and the heart of and peace and security at the heart of global solidarity we need a new new social contract we need this principle of socialism and solidarity together and we need social legitimacy for multilateralism the problem is now multilateralism is at risk the new geopolitics and so how do we sustain the this that is at risk if we want to create something new and, and here is the importance of civil society, of the church, and of universities and, and schools. Uh, and then the relationship with nature. For example, nobody has developed the ecological debt that Pope Francis was denouncing in Laudato Si five years ago. The ecological debt means that many people have increased their economic, um, many countries and many companies have increased their, have, is, are better off economically at the expense of others, but particularly of the of the nature of others, of the of the ecosystem of others. Um, so, how are we going to count this financially? Well, this is this is a, a great. Uh, it's very difficult. But why do we start teaching that in the university? Students will be on fire if we have a one sub one year eco on ecological debt. Imagine, <laughs> then internalizing ecological cost. I, I we are we are here at the Vatican. Some of us. We are really, really um, 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 I mean, we, okay, so some of this. Um, so we are, we are worried about these things called externalities, no? Um, so why don't we internalize the ecological cost? And then some people necessarily will go bankrupt, of course, if you are polluting. But this is, this is again a matter of justice. The energy transition, the sustain and sustainability by sustainability by design. Sustainability cannot be at the end of the design of products, of the design of systems, of the design of policies. It has to be at the beginning, and that's why it's so important to teach that in at schools, because other people will have to learn it when they're working, and it's too late for that. So why do we help to create this sustainability by design um, at, at our schools and our teachings? And I will end up. Because maybe you you think, well, this priest is mad. Why? Why? Who? How? What does he know about economics? Probably, compared to some of you, I know nothing. But I will I will tell you something about three Nobel prizes in economics. I can I can I can I can quote at least ten or fifteen. But let's talk about three. Uh, then um, one that I know very well because my my PhD was about that. Although I've forgotten a lot, but <laughs> it's Amartya Sen. 
So Amartya Sen, when he explains the origin of economics, he says that the, it comes like it has two origins, no? At, roughly at the same time, uh, no? centuries before Christ. One was Aristotle, mentioned by Jeffrey Sachs, no? about and, 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 and Aristotle put in, in um, within Nicomachean ethics. So economics was an ethical subject. No? Why? Because it's about human ends, and wealth is about uh, it's, it's a means to the end, to some ends. So the question about economics of how to integrate wealth, which is a means, with other goals, particularly with, a, with bigger goals. But that was Aristotle's question. But then in India, he said, uh, the book of uh, Kautila, which is, according to Amartya Sen, is the first proper economic manual, uh, is about the engineering of wealth production. No? It's about the mathematical models. But se he says, both started at the same time. And, and Sen explains how all good economies, they have always taken into account the ethical dimension and the model mathematical dimension. When the last decades, the problem is that eco economists, they have no idea that they're, for ages they have been together. Even for example, with the discussion of the, the theory of value, you, 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 can, you could disagree with many of the things of the theory of value, but at least they were discussing the theory of, no, in the, in the classical economics. But now nobody's even discussing what is the value of my product, my design of my service. So to recover these two dimensions is very important. And another, other two Nobel Prizes, Nobel Prize winners are Paul Romer and William Nordhaus. No? And they said that sustainability, sustainable economic growth is related with the creation of ideas. Look at it, this is what we are trying to do at schools, no? with the creation of ideas and with inclusive education and innovation that we need to start from school because otherwise it's too late, but also with a care for nature. Look at that, I mean, and they are, have nothing to do with the Catholic Church, no? But look at how the, the even the, the analysis of the problem, to go back to where I began, comes from a good education that can link what is missing with new things, with sustainability and growth. But that requires imagination, and the imagination we have to cultivate it at school. So if we cannot do this, uh, we will fail. Why? Oikonomos, economies, is the administration of the house, but it's related with oikologos, that is the life of the house. Now, the life of the house also is not just other creatures, I would say. It's about the people living interaction, that is called oikumene, the dialogue within the house. No? Look at the three words, oikologos, oikumene, oikonomos, in Greek. They all, they all have the same root, that is oikos, house. So the administration should take into account the life. The life should take into account the, the dialogue or politics. So politics, economics, and ecology, there are three things that needs to be intertwined. And if we don't teach that at economic business and uh, financial schools, we will be training people to be part of the problem and not part of the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the symphony. Uh, we'll stop. Stop your share, share screen. Yeah, stop share. Thank you. Perfect. Great. So we'll hold we'll hold questions till uh, till later. Uh, so the next panelist, of course, needs no introduction. Father Michael Garanzini uh, is the secretary for higher education of the Society of Jesus and the chair of the International Association of Jesuit Universities. His background is in the area of uh, psychology and religion. He's a former president and chancellor of Loyola University, Chicago. Father Garanzini has led several initiatives to facilitate national and international collaboration among Jesuit universities. Currently, he also advises the leadership people and organizational area of the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University on how Catholic social teaching can better guide management education. Father Garanzini. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I, I hope that my, uh, my contribution will build on what we've heard from, from Jeffrey and, and from, from Augusto, uh, which I found really very stimulating and very, very helpful. Um, I thought what I would do is focus just for a moment on the student 
that we're that we're teaching or the student that we're going to teach. So we've heard a we've heard the case for why the present system isn't the present economic system isn't really working well for the human race <laughs> for for all of us. And we've heard uh, Augusto very very deftly uh, point out what the theoretical uh, weak points are and what the inadequacies are of the present approach in a number of, of these areas, especially the discipline of uh, economics. I want to I want to look for a minute at the at the student we're going to teach. Um, before COVID nineteen, this generation Generation Z um, has been studied. And whenever you look at the studies of where these young people are today, the people who are either just entering our universities or who are about to enter our universities, when you look at that and you ask them, what are their biggest concerns? Um, I've been in education for 30 years, and this, is, this, is, this reminds me of, of uh, ages past. It's, these are not like the more recent generations that we have seen in coming to university. Uh, so this Generation Z that, that, that is that it's called, um, they talk about and they're concerned about things like, um, I'll give you just the top four things that keep coming up over and over in these surveys and studies of this group. Environmental degradation is almost always at the very top. If not, it's always, it's one of the four. Uh, economic um, marginalization. That is, they're concerned about the in, inadequacy, in, inequalities within societies and then between nations. Um, too many people marginalized from the economic mainstream. Uh, they're concerned about violence and that, that might be violence against women, Violence, violence against children. They, they, they've grown up with a lot of talk about the, um, the, the child abuse problem and, and institutional abuse of, of young people. And then the fourth one is always, at least one of the top four, is an economic insecurity. A little more uh, about their own economic insecurities and the, and the, the way they see uh, big shifts going on in the economy and um, and so on. No matter where you rank those, um, economic insecurity is usually not number one. It's usually number three or number four of those top four. You, you, you see a generation that is much more outwardly focused and much more aware of the social dynamics in their own lives and in the world that are not, um, that are not just. So this strong sense of an, in, an injustice in the world kind of marks this Generation Z. And it's not as self-centered and as self-motivated as we have seen in the past. So I wouldn't be surprised if young people are attracted to go to business school because they want economic security, but they carry with them a, a, a big concern for um, for what's right and what's fair. And I think the, as we've heard from both of our previous speakers, um, a sense of the common good, what, what's fair for all of us. Now, I think COVID-19 will be the defining uh, historical moment of this generation's life going forward. They will be they're impacted like this about this in ways that you know 9/11 did not do. I think the Great Depression of the 30s did not do. Uh, perhaps something like World War II did for for most people in the world. But but truly, this is a global phenomenon, and it's a global phenomenon that they know and experience, and that they see the implications of this uh, daily, nightly on the new. Um, they see that this pandemic has reached, has reaped incredible food insecurities. Um, it's, it's reaped incredible, it's exposed incredible health disparities. 
It's exposed the failures and the limitations of government. It's exposed the failures and limitations of the, of the economic and business community. Uh, it's produced more economic insecurity and chaos, and we have not seen the end of that. Um, we could have, it's predicted by any number of people, that there will be much more economic insecurity as uh, things like <laughs> the food industry and the supply chain and things like the health industry and its supply chain and, the, and things like uh, banking and things like real estate all are affected, impacted by uh, this pandemic. So this is, this is the group of students that will be coming into our doors, a bit traumatized the same way World War II or the Great Depression or 9-11 traumatized generations in the past and it colored the way they're gonna look at the world and their future. So what is Jesuit education about? Jesuit education is first and foremost not about giving skills. It's not about simply passing on knowledge. It's not about accumulations of knowledge and skills. It's about formation. A Jesuit education is about forming the entire person to be, to have the character to be able to deal with what the world, the world that they're about to enter and the world that we want them to create. It's about the world we want for them and we want them to want. It's character formation. Now, it makes a difference then, a big difference in what values we promote when we are teaching them. Um, we, are not, we are not people who can be neutral to, to say that we're neutral about the values that they, that they pick up. Uh, here's economics, here's the theory, here's how it works. Here's finance, here's how the finance industry works. Here's accounting, this is what the laws are. Here's marketing, here's management. To say that, that we can do that is, a, is, a, is, is putting blinders on and, because we are communicating values. And the kind of values we communicate make all the difference to whether or not we are going to feed the hungers that they have or whether or not we're going to ignore them and they're going to have to find them elsewhere. What does this imply, I think, for faculty? I think the faculty of the future, and I'm talking about <laughs> the fall, I'm talking about this, this coming year, I'm not talking about the distant future. I think the faculty of the future have to realize that their job is not being a subject expert. It's not about delivering the content of a discipline. It's about becoming with them a questioner, becoming with the student an explorer, because they know, given that list of problems that COVID-19 has exposed, given that the, their natural tendency to, to sense the world is not fair, it's not completely fair and it's not just yet, they know that we don't have those answers. They, they don't expect us to have the answers. They expect us to be a fellow sojourner, a fellow questioner with them on the journey to find out and find solutions for the world's most pressing problems. They expect us to be not um, uncritical purveyors of information, but, but critical of the theoretical foundations on which our own disciplines and subject matter are based. And they, they expect us to, be, to help them engage the world, because that's what they want. They want to engage the world. They don't want to just read about it or look at it. They want to engage it. Such, and such that, that when they find inconsistencies or problems or they have questions, that we don't believe that we have the automatic answer, but that huh? we will put them along the um. So I'm hoping that um, when we return in the fall, um, 
that we use this as an opportunity, especially since we won't be meeting with them face to face as much as we used to in the past. It's what it looks like anyway. But the, and we will see them a bit traumatized and extremely insecure because they don't know if their parents and their own education are gonna be disrupted by the continuing fallout of this particular pandemic um, that will help them recover a sense of hope in the future when we say with them, let's build a better economic theory base. Let's build a better finance system. Let's build a more just uh, business climate that takes account of those who might be impacted by the, the, the activities of this particular industry. Uh, let's, let's work on this together so that we can build that kind of world that you and you, your own children will want to live in. They are really at a point where they're saying, what kind of a world are we going to be living in? Th this isn't an abstract question for them because it's, there's, there's so much that's unsure and incomplete that surrounds them. So what I'm, I'm, I guess I'm calling for and what I'm reminding us of is that a Jesuit education is about taking a journey with the student. And it's, and it's about a willingness to open up our own minds and our own eyes to see what they see and to see further than, than they see. Uh, it, it's not about having answers. It's not about pur purveying a content for them. They, they, can, they, they know they can read that. They, this whole experience with Zoom and so on has taught them there's only one value for being in school and that's being able to talk it out, not simply getting information dumped into you. They know they can do that on their own. So that, so that's, that was my, that's my message. Uh, it's really to build on uh, Jeffries and, and Augusto's because I think they did a wonderful job of, of setting up the, the context that we're going to be going into uh, as business faculty in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Father Garanzini. Uh, I had initially thought of having uh, kind of questions at this time for you know Father Garanzini and Father uh, Zampini, but I'm going to hold off on it and instead uh, go on to uh, the next two panelists who both have kind of actually done tremendous work in uh, trying to you know work on sustainable uh, business education programs um, and so uh, let me first uh, introduce our uh, the first panelist uh, dr stuart hart dr dr hart is one of the world's top authorities on the implications of the environment and poverty for business strategy he's the founder of the center for sustainable global enterprise at Cornell University, as well as founder of Enterprise for a Sustainable World and base of the Pyramid network, uh, Global Network. He's also the co-founder and former director of the Sustainable Innovation MBA at the University of Vermont's Grossman School of Business. Professor Hart has published over 100 papers and cases and authored or edited eight books with over 35,000 Google Scholar citations. His work has appeared in leading scholarly journals he has received numerous honors and awards for his work and has served as consultant, advisor, or management educator for dozens of corporations. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Hart? Father Santos, thank you. I'm going to share my screen as well, if I can do that. Yes. Right. All right, I think we're there. Um, I think we're seeing your, yeah, now. No. There we go, okay. All right. Uh, so th thank you all, uh, uh, Father Santo, uh, Father Garanzini, Michael Pearson, thank you all for, for inviting me and having me today. Um, 
let me start, you know, just with a, a premise, you know, and, and I think it's consistent with the one that we've heard so far that we are indeed at one of those inflection points, one of those moments in history. Uh, and if I zero in on a little bit more in terms of its meaning for business education, I think we are at that point where the age of shareholder primacy and market fundamentalism finally comes to a close. I, th I think we are at, at that defining moment. And, uh, and, you know, and, and for me, I've been at this a while. Uh, when I first uh, published this book now 15 years ago, uh, one of the main reactions I got was, you know, isn't that title kind of over the top, right? The capitalism at the crossroads, really? You know, and, but, but I think in, you know, in the space of a decade or more, we've come a long distance to the point now where I don't think anyone questions a title like this. I think we truly are at one of those crossroads and COVID will simply be an accelerator of the process. It's an accelerant. And, it, and if, we, if we can seize this moment, even though it's tragic, can come out of it, you know, it can help us, it can help lead to a new age of true sustainability and inclusion. Uh, you know, I absolutely believe that's the case. And for business education, uh, you know, to uh, uh, invoke Game of Thrones, uh, you know, I think there, winter is coming for sure, you know, for business education, for business as usual, and for capitalism as we've known it for the past 30 plus years. You know, that the M existing MBA is a declining category everywhere, right? Decli declining number of applicants. Uh, it's become, you know, a very sort of technical, ideological, transactional kind of experience where it's all about the money, all about the job, uh, all, all about getting tooled up and skilled up and so forth, as Father Garanzini was saying. And, you know, I think it's, it, it, I think it's clear, even in conventional MBA programs, you, you sort of see a thirst until it's sort of eaten out of people for meaning, for purpose, you know, that, that there's an opportunity here to return to something that resembles a, a profession, right? Not, not just getting a bunch of technical skills so you can go make money. Uh, and in some ways it's similar to what was happening back, you know, a century or more ago when business schools were first founded, right? They, they were really founded on the premise of making management a profession, right? To, to having it, for it to have social legitimacy because corporations a hundred years ago or 120 years ago, you know, were, it were, were run by robber barons and, and there were some real questions about their role in society. So I think, I think we're at another one of those kind of inflection points. And, you know, and so for, for me, the last eight years or so has been a very interesting opportunity uh, to, to get involved with the creation of a completely new MBA program. Because, you know, for the past, I've been, I've been teaching in business schools for 35 years. Uh, you know, I was, at, I was at Michigan, I was at UNC, I was at Cornell, and was involved in kind of establishing centers for sustainable business, all those places and programs. But, the, but what that would typically mean to, uh, you know, to use the metaphor of a saddlebag is that, you know, you create, you, you typically have a center, there might be a few professors involved, uh, you have some research projects. And then in the curriculum, it means, you know, maybe a couple of courses or a practicum in the second year as electives, right? So that's the proverbial saddlebag, you know, hanging off the side of the horse, but, but the horse never really changes. You, know, you can take the saddle off and it's the same old core curriculum, you know, as it was 30 years ago when, you know, shareholder primacy took business schools over in the 80s, right? That, that, that's, that's what, that, that was what happened back then. So we've had, you know, with this program at the University of Vermont, the Sustainable Innovation MBA, the rare opportunity to start from scratch. You know, we had a, uh, there was a new dean that came in now going on 10 years ago, a guy named Sanjay Sharma, who, for whom this was also his personal passion. And that opened the door to start over again, right? To, we literally abolished the existing MBA program and started with a clean sheet of paper and, and developed something called the Sustainable uh, and, you know, certainly took a lot, of, we had, a, we gained a lot of courage from the fact that I know, I, I know we have at least a couple of colleagues from Presidio on the call today, you know, Presidio had done, had taken that step some years before. So we gained some courage, you know, from, from Presidio's prior experience in, in stepping out. Uh, and that's what we did, right? And, and our intention was to reinvent business education, to, to launch a new generation of leaders to transform capitalism to solve the world's most pressing challenges. And, 
And so over the past, you know, six, seven years, we're now on our sixth cohort of a 12 month program. And I'll speak briefly about what that looks like. We, we have been able to kind of stand this program up, you know, and it's, it's gained some notoriety, some visibility. Uh, we take seriously, for example, the corporate Knights ranking, the Better World MBA ranking. We've been number one in the US for the past year or two. In that one, the Princeton Review Best Green MBA, we pay less attention or no attention to things like the Business Week or US News and World Report rankings because I think, as we all know, those are primarily about how much more money you make when you graduate. Uh, we're not opposed to money, uh, but we don't think that's, we're a purpose driven MBA program. And our purpose, as I'll describe in a moment, is to work with our students to help them dis discover who their best self is and how they can have the most positive impact in the world. So the way, the way that that, uh, the way we've tried to develop the program, because it is uh, uh, AACSB, it, we, we, are, we, we are accredited, right? So it's an AACSB accredited business, uh, business MBA program in a business school, in a research university. So of course that carries with it uh, a number of challenges. <laughs> uh, so you, you must, of course, teach kind of what we would think of as the core, quote, toolkit, which we do, but we do it in a very different way, right? Uh, there are, we don't have core courses and electives. We have a lockstep curriculum where all the students go through the same experience together, and we build a culture around that that's quite different from the traditional MBA culture. And we even teach, you know, the, the traditional functions in a very different way with a much more critical eye. You know, what, what are the toxic side effects of applying the conventional wisdom you know, in an unfettered way, unquestioned way? And we've also been able to remove, because we started with a clean sheet of paper, a lot of the old legacy content, which is just there in the core, because it's always been there, because that's what uh, you know, teaching loads are designed around. But if you really take a close look, there's really no compelling reason why a lot of the content is still in core courses in business schools, just because it's always there and that's the teaching load. When you start over again with a clean sheet, you can actually get rid of a lot of that stuff. And it has no bearing on accreditation or anything else. And then in its place, we've been able to bring in a lot of content you would not typically find in an MBA program having to do with all the issues that have been discussed so far uh, on this wonderful session, you know, be it the SDGs or uh, climate change, or poverty, inequality, you know, kind of inclusive business, circular economy, stakeholder engagement, deep dialogue. These are all kind of, all of this is core to our MBA program because we think that's going to be crucial uh, to be an effective, being an effective citizen and business person uh, in the future. And beyond the curriculum, because in some ways, the curriculum is the easy part, right? I mean, I, I, I don't mean to, <laughs> I don't mean to downplay what a challenge it was to start with a clean sheet develop a new program from scratch with 25 courses that are one and two credits each. So you break the mold, all the coursework done in nine months, and then practicum, you know, the final three months as the capstone experience. That was no small challenge. But I think what we've discovered along the way, you know, in, in uh, now our sixth iteration of, of running this program, is, you know, that, that you have to think of this as a system, you know, not just a curriculum that you run people through. That in some ways the content, the curriculum is important, but it's it you know it's only the instrumentality, right? That the crucial thing is how do you how do you find and attract the right people for a program like this, right? That this is not a conventional MBA where you're coming in to get your ticket punch so you can make more money, right? That's just it just simply isn't. You know we're very much a purpose-driven business school. Money is important, obviously. People you need money to live but that's not our objective you know, in, this, in this program. So we're looking to enroll kind of students who are inspired to harness business for good. That, so it's really key in how you message, how you send signals about what your program is about, and then how you uh, attract and admit students, that you admit the right students, because frankly, they'll be unhappy. You know, if, if you admit students that are looking for the conventional MBA experience into a program such as this, they're not satisfied with the program. So, you know, kind of finding and admitting the right students is crucial. And that often means kind of finding new pools of potential applicants. In many cases, there are people who weren't even thinking about business school. They were thinking about, you know, public policy school or social work uh, or, en or engineering school or environment school or law school, right? That 
that when they stumble upon and discover our program, they realize this is something that really could help them be their best self. And then on the back end, right, that if we just were to do a conventional bolt-on MBA placement office, not only would it be completely disingenuous, but it wouldn't work, right? I mean, because that's, that's just not, that's not what we try to develop, you know, in, you know, over the course of the program. That, you know, we, we work, we call it launch, not placement. And we spent the last two or three years really focusing on how to design a unique back end that's consistent with our mission driven approach. And the and launch is really all about working from the very beginning to help students to you know, sort of find their own North Star. What is it that they want to do in the world? What impact do they think they can have in the world? Uh, you know, kind of what's their best self? What's their calling? And then to help them identify what's the best immediate next step you can take when you finish this MBA program. What's the, you know, because everyone's going to take a next step, so let's have it be purposeful. And it has to be in line with your North Star, right? So that our, our approach to launch is very much about that. And then, you know, developing a set of relationships with people out there in the world of practice that share our DNA, right? That are willing to uh, do informational interviews, provide mentorship, provide support, provide inreach, provide referrals. So it's an, it's an organized process of self-discovery and then organized networking. And the culture is one of being a, you know, entrepreneur, a creator of opportunity, not a passive recipient of jobs that land in your lap, right? Which I would, is how I would characterize the conventional two-year MBA program. It's almost an entitlement. I pay you a lot of money. You find me a high-paying job. Uh, even though in many cases, the students that finish those programs don't end up being terribly satisfied with the result, right? Because I taught in those programs for the better part of 30 years. But this one, I think, has, has a fundamentally different kind of approach, a different philosophy. And our, our belief is that's how you have the most impact. And that's all you, also how you create the, the best people, you know, the, the people with virtue out there in the world that can potentially change business. Now, uh, we're, we're not naive enough to think that just by creating this MBA program, that's going to change the world, you know, given the scale of the challenges and the opportunities we realize that it's necessary to move beyond just our MBA program. So we have, have worked with other schools that are interested in transformation, that are interested in transforming their, their business programs, their MBAs, uh, as is Presidio. So, you know, I've had some conversations with colleagues there, uh, as is Bard, and have had conversations with colleagues there, uh, to, because we know that we need to make this the norm, right? Over the, in the, over the next short period of years, we need to creatively destroy business education and stand up a completely new way, completely new approach to doing it. So, you know, we must create a larger initiative, which is what this is all about, why I'm so excited to be part of it, uh, in transforming business education around the world. Part of what, and one of the things we've been able to do, kind of that spun off our Sustainable Innovation MBA is we've been able to develop an online program called the Leading the Sustainability Transformation Program. It's a, you know, eight week uh, badge certificate program that draws content from our program, but also embeds that in a real world simulation role play where people are able to apply and learn, you know, these, the, the, how, how to think and behave differently. <laughs> Uh, to, to realize the sort of transformative change that's going to be required through business. That includes dealing with key stakeholders in government and in civil society and in communities uh, and realizing that as business people, we have to become proactive when it comes to public policy and when it comes to communities. So all that's kind of embedded and is part of this uh, online program. And we found this also has been very useful for some uh, business school fact and schools that are interested in really standing up new programs. Uh, we've had, you know, a critical mass of faculty participate in this program, and that's helped the schools kind of develop a common language and a way to talk about this. So anyway, if, that, if that's of interest for anyone, in, you know, kind of looking down the line, this is a program now that we're, you know, we've co-branded with GreenBiz that many of you are probably familiar with. It's geared primarily toward business, you know, sort of practicing business professionals, practitioners, both, you know, kind of younger people looking to have impact, but also more senior executives. But we found this is a, also a very effective program in the university setting as well. So let me stop there and just say, you know, I think that we are, you know, at the cusp 
of the next capitalist reformation, right? Cap capitalism has gone through many iterations over the last several hundred years, and we are in the midst of one of those right now. Uh, how can business and capitalism be redesigned to include, serve, and lift the underserved while simultaneously conserving and replenishing the natural capital that supports all life on Earth? And obviously, we have to make money while doing it, but it's profit and service of purpose. So let me stop there. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Um, so we'll we'll move on to our next uh, our next panelist, uh, Ms. Hunter Lovins. Ms. Lovins is president and founder of National Natural Capitalism Solutions, a renowned author and champion of sustainable development for over thirty five years. Ms. Lovins has consulted on business economic development sustainable agriculture, energy, water, security, and climate policies for scores of governments, communities, and companies worldwide. Ms. Lovins has won numerous awards and has served on boards of governments, nonprofit organizations, and for-profit companies. Her areas of expertise include natural capitalism, sustainable development, globalization, energy and resource policy, economic development, climate change, land management, fire rescue, and emergency medicine. She developed the Economic Renewal Project and was a founding professor of business at Presidio Graduate School, one of the first accredited programs offering an MBA in sustainable management. Ms. Lovins has taught at numerous universities around the world and is currently a founding professor of sustainable management at Bard MBA. Uh, Ms. Lovins? Sustainability is happening, whether it be Harvard Business Review articles saying that it is the key to competitive advantage, or my friend Yvonne Chouinard getting the cover of Fortune magazine, or God save us, the evil empire going green. Look, when Walmart goes green, you know there's a business case. Business as taught is the problem. Neoliberal economics is driving the world to collapse. Shareholder primacy is legally wrong. Julie Sharp showed that. It is morally bankrupt. And business as usual has created the crises that are facing us that Jeff Sachs walked through. It isn't even good business. The factoid of the week, Tesla, little Tesla, just surpassed Exxon in market capitalization. Exxon's going down, Tesla's going up. And we've, we've got our priorities confused. Markets make a great servant. They're not such a good master. They're a terrible religion. And we have turned markets into a religion. Neoliberalism was invented to solve problems. In 1947, 36 men, and yeah, they were all men, got together outside Montreux, Switzerland, to deal with the fact that Europe was in ruins after World War II. Ludwig von Mises was appalled at what National Socialism had done to trash Europe. Frederick Hayek was scared to death of the rise in the East of Soviet collectivism. Milton Friedman believed that the individual was the only legitimate economic actor. Their primary, their, their prime directive, if you will, was freedom, individual freedom. But they based what they were doing on some bad science. They said, we're all greedy bastards, but that's okay because the market is perfect. And in a perfect market, you against me will somehow aggregate to the greater good for all. No, it won't, and it hasn't. And we are now facing potentially the collapse of human civilization. Dr. Paul Lawrence at Harvard, Dr. Michael Pearson at Fordham show us that humans don't only have a drive to acquire and defend, we have a drive to bond. 
This is the skull of an old man. He was toothless. He was one of a tribe of pre-humans. Pre-humans almost went extinct. We almost didn't exist. His tribe took care of him. If you're in it for yourself, if number one is all that matters, you don't take care of toothless old men. You don't take care of cripples. And we know from the archeology, span from the evolutionary biology, from the DNA, his DNA is in you. When you care, that's what it means to be human. This is the better science. It better fits with the known facts. Humans care. We have a drive to care and we have a drive to create meaning, to comprehend. We tell stories. The economy as we see it today is just a story. Neoliberalism is just a story. As Thomas Berry said, we need a better story. Here's the story of today. We people, the planet, are in service to the economy, which is in service to finance. We're really good at sending money to the top. What's wrong with this picture? It's wrong way round. Finance is a tool to bring liquidity, money, to the real economy, which needs to be in service to life. So in 2009, as the Copenhagen Climate Conference was failing, Dr. Eben Goodstein and I got together and agreed, we need a new business school. And we created the Bard MBA to take all of these concepts that we've been talking about today and others and blend them. We put it as part of the Bard Center for Environmental Policy, which offers a number of programs. We based it not on conventional business curriculum. I mean, I did that when I built Presidio. We took Stu's great pioneership at uh, Keenan Flagler, which, as he said, was a saddlebag program. And we said, what if you taught every class from the standpoint of sustainability, of how do you honorably do business in this time of crisis? At Bard, we started from a different standpoint. We took the SDGs, we took the planetary boundaries, we took Kate Rayworth's donut economics and Janine Benyus's biomimicry. We took social justice. We took concepts like SASB, which is built off our integrated bottom line. We took John Fullerton's principles of regenerative capitalism. And I'm not gonna walk through these, but I highly commend to you this paper by John, Regenerative Capitalism. In 40 odd years of doing this work, this is the best I have found. At a framing, principles drawn from how nature does business. We teach regenerative agriculture, regenerative energy policy, because these together, are both better business, and they're also the solution to the climate crisis. We know how to solve the climate crisis at a profit, and it's what's happening in the market. This isn't taught at conventional business schools, and as a result, they are doing their students a disservice. The other thing we did was say, we want faculty who do this for their day job, for whom implementing sustainability regenerative practices is what they know what to do. And then they'll teach on the side. So Kathy Hippel, who teaches finance accounting, was just cited in the New York Times yesterday in the article that showed that the fracking companies, which are now all collapsing, paid their managers massive bonuses within days, weeks of when they declared bankruptcy. Kathy's day job is with IEFA working on the energy and financial analysis of the energy sector. Or Alejandro Crawford, who is an entrepreneur himself, building a marvelous tool called Rebel Base, which you can use with your students to help them learn how to be entrepreneurs. Alejandro and Kathy and I created Disrupt to Sustain, where we bring students from business schools around the world to a pitch competition. Alejandro and, and even and I and some others are also recreating the whole concept of a certificate program, basing it though on these fundamental concepts of how should business be done for the future. 
Laura Gitman, who is managing director of BSR and teaches our NYC lab. In their first year, students become consultants to real companies, delivering real value to them. They hit the ground running. Michael Schumann, the leading expert on local economic solutions. Our students win awards. They were some of the winners of the Patagonia competition, Columbia, various other pitch competitions. And they then go on to work at a diversity of companies, whether it be Deloitte or small economic development groups that you will never have heard of. Our students are fulfilling our motto, which is lead the change. We base a lot of this on a book that you can get called A Finer Future, where a group of us tried to pull together what's wrong, what do we need to do instead, and where is it happening in the world? Every assertion footnoted. Because if we did honest accounting, no business on the planet would be profitable today. This was the conclusion of true cost. If you count the actual cost to the economy of the environmental losses from business as usual, no business would be profitable. So what we're practicing is perhaps best called cheater capitalism or crapitalism. This is not good capitalism. We're lying to ourselves. So Beavis Longstreth, he was SEC commissioner, said it's entirely plausible, even predictable, that continuing to hold equities in fossil fuel companies will be ruled negligence. Why? Because Exxon and the others are no longer performing and they haven't been for the better part of a decade. You've heard the phrase, the triple bottom line, the three-legged stool. Come on, businesses are not gonna keep three separate books. When John Elkington introduced this concept, it was a good one. We prefer the integrated bottom line, where we show that behaving responsibly to people and planet enhances your financial performance. It cuts costs, it drives profitability, it drives innovation, it reduces your risk, it attracts and retains the best talent and increases labor productivity. The companies that care about human dignity, human engagement, good green buildings, clean air, have 24% higher productivity, 21% higher profitability. How do you brand yourself in today's world? Father Garanzini talked about the new generation. They really don't care about the, the stuff that we're teaching in business school. They care about, are they going to have a future? Supply chains, how do you manage supply chains? In a circular fashion, we use Walter Stahel's work who invented the concept of the circular economy of cradle to cradle. All of this reduces the cost of distrust. We've counted 13 different aspects of this integrated bottom line. Bob Willard took some of these and put them into a spreadsheet showing that if you count just seven of these and count, take the middle values, not the highest value, you come up with an increased profitability of 38%. This is just better business. Yes, Jeff is right. We need ethics. We, we, we need to be teaching our students why they should care. We need to be guiding them. But if all you are is Milton Friedman caring about value to owners, this is better value to owners. And this is why Frank Warner and the others at SASB have taken the tack of, we are going to show that measuring these is material. Because if it's material, in the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission will rule that these have to be included in your financial reporting. And at that point, the world changes. Every company that is listed on the New York Stock Exchange that, that wants to do business under the realm of the SEC is going to have to start caring about this. You want your students to have a guaranteed job, teach them to be, says, be certified. So Fordham, where I also teach, is embedding SASB in its introduction to its incoming students. 
I worked with Ray Anderson, the great industrial leader who was one of the first to show this business case. In fact, I was with Ray. He was sort of amazed. He said, this isn't why I'm doing this, my commitment to sustainability, but everything I'm doing for sustainability is enhancing every aspect of shareholder value. He said, what is the business case for ending life on earth? He said, I tell my people, you can come to work to make carpet or you can come to work to change history. And Ray did. Change is coming. It's coming fast. It's coming whether we like it or not. It came this year in the form of the pandemic. And that's really only the first crisis to come at us, as Jeff said. We've learned one person can change the world. Greta said, adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope. I don't want your hope. I want you to feel the fear that I feel, and then I want you to act. I want you to act as if the house was on fire, because it is. She also said, why should I be in school when there's not going to be a future? This is the challenge to us to ensure that the young people have a future. We can only do this if we transform how business is done, and we can only do that if we transform business education. So thanks very much to all of you. At BARD, as, as Stu said, we're very happy to share our curriculum, to consult with any of you, to help you figure out how to do this. I'll put my email in the chat box. Feel free to contact me if I can ever be of any service to you. Please let me know. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Ms. Lovins. Uh, that was great. Um, before, before we get, we have, we have a little time for uh, Q&A. And, &A, and uh, before, before we get into Q&A, I forgot to mention in my opening remarks, uh, the gratitude that we should have to Fordham University and to Donna Rappacilli and the, and the Gabili School of Business for kind of providing the platform for us, but also kind of uh, Donna Rappacilli uh, with uh, Father Garanzini kind of uh, helped put together this task force. And because of that task force, we are here today kind of trying to, uh, you know, re-envision uh, what uh, business education should be. Uh, so thank you to all the to all the panelists. Uh, with that, probably we could go to a few a few questions. Um, so let's start with uh, a question coming from Ecuador. Um, so the question is if if uh, if neoliberal if the neoliberal economic system is rooted uh, in political power in the most powerful countries, how can we change this uh, global order? How do we foster real democracy in a world where money rules? and not the well-being of uh, everybody. So this is to any of the, any of the panelists. I think a good place to start is the recognition that the well-being of everyone is better business. And you can then build on that, that it's also the moral imperative. It's also the survival imperative. If we do not fundamentally transform how we do business, how we live our lives, and again, the best science says society as we know it could collapse. Don't do this because it'll put you in a very bad mood, but you can Google near-term human extinction and find what purports to be science that says humans go extinct within the next 10 years. And there are people like Dark Mountain Project in the UK who say it's over, give it up. Grieve, but then get over it. Party on because there's nothing we can do. And I think this is the most profoundly irresponsible position we can take. When rabbits are threatened, they freeze. When humans are threatened, we entrepreneur. We now know that the companies that are leading in ESG are financially outperforming the others. I mentioned the productivity profitability statistics. This is from Gallup Healthways that every year surveys workforces around the world. The most productive workforces are those that are engaged. How do you get an engaged workforce? First, you treat them with dignity. This is the Michael Pearson's work. 
Second, you enable them to implement more sustainable practices as part of their day job. So when you do this, again, you're just doing business better. You don't have to believe in the SDGs. You don't even have to care. All you have to care about is making more money and you will begin to do this because it's better business. Yep. I, I also think that part, part of the emerging, sort of the emerging paradigm of thinking about sustainable business or sustainable capitalism means that business leaders, whereas historically their relationship with government was primarily one of lobbying, which you know was code for uh, working behind the scenes to free, you know, to, to ensure the continued advantage represented by the status quo. Uh, is giving way and must give way to, a, to, the, to the opposite, which is to say engagement with government, reestablishing government you know, as the positive force that it needs to be right? if, if we're in fact to have a sustainable society and to have business leaders stand up in favor of those more progressive policies. That, I think that's, we haven't yet gotten there, but I think that that is our next challenge, right? That, that, that's how fundamentally we change the game. I, I agree completely with Stuart. Um, the uh, governments are incredibly sensitive to business leadership. Um, they're international corporations that um, seem to get a pass from having to pay a lot of attention to local governments, but still most governments are pretty, pretty sensitive to where business leaders are. Educating the next generation of business leadership is critical if we're going to change the political landscape, if we're going to preserve something like democratic societies, it's critical that we have business leaders that really press government to do that. Uh, leadership of government doesn't really come out of uh, schools of government, don't come out of political science departments. Those are analysts of, of, of government and government policy. Uh, the politicians are, to a large extent, our, uh, our business people. Thank you. I, f I forgot to mention earlier that uh, both Professor Sachs as well, uh, as, well as uh, Father Zimpini had to leave. Uh, but if you all have questions for them specifically, you can email uh, any of us and we can forward it to them. I have a question here for, uh, for Ms. Lovins as well as Dr. Hart. Uh, at uh, Vermont and Bard, uh, you know, are the faculty in the program interdisciplinary? Do they have PhDs? or training in humanities, social sciences, policy, environmental health, as well as areas of uh, business. Go ahead, Hunter. We are hugely interdisciplinary. Our faculty regularly meets. We compare syllabi, what each one of us is teaching, so that we don't either double up or miss anything. We co-teach a lot of classes. And we then cooperate on creating programs like the Disrupt to Sustain Pitch Fest, in which, for example, in my Principles of Sustainable Management class, I have the first year students doing a term project. Kathy, in her accounting class, has students doing a term project. So they become the same project. The marketing professor has his students in the second year doing a term project. The entrepreneurial professor has them creating a company they merge these teams and then they all pitch the entire school becomes part of this pitch competition it isn't a little thing over on the side it's how all of the students and all of the faculty come together to ensure that our students are learning in this truly interdisciplinary way yeah uh, absolutely and in, our, in the experience of trying to stand up this uh Sustainable Innovation MBA, it's been a really interesting ride, as you might imagine. And uh, so you abolish the MBA program as it was, and you start with a clean sheet of paper. And that, that becomes a very sort of iterative, co-creative process of trying to figure out how, how to first design and then staff, right, a program like that. And one of the things that we realized early on was that, uh, you know, quite as you might expect, at that point in time, we did not have the faculty in the business school to teach everything that needed to be in the curriculum. So it, of necessity, we had to reach out to other, other parts of the university, like the Gund Institute, uh, like the Rubenstein School for the Environment, like the Community Development Applied Economics uh, Group, like 
the Vermont Law School and some others. And, uh, and so that, that, that then, grad, and then, and then the reach outside the university too, right? So we do, we do have non-faculty members teaching in the program, but the program as we've, def as we've developed it now is, as I mentioned, a lockstep program. So uh, you could say that all the courses are core and that we have faculty, non-business school faculty that are, that are really teaching core material in the program because the whole program is core, right? So, so by definition, that's the case. And we've sort of locked into that now because it, make, it just makes good sense. But having said that, over the last five, six years, as the program has kind of gained, has gained some recognition, we've also been able to attract new faculty who otherwise probably wouldn't have come to a place like the University of Vermont, right? Who had choices, who could have gone other places, but were attracted to come in various areas, you know, be it marketing or be it operations or be it accounting or be it strategy or management. They came because of the Sustainable Innovation MBA program, because that's where their heart was. Uh, and so we've been able to kind of build up a critical mass of faculty now who, who are able, right, to carry a, a, you know, sort of a much more significant portion of the program than when we first started. So it becomes a virtuous circle at the same time. Thank you. Uh, I said uh, our faculty, some of them happen to have PhDs, but that's not why we hire them. We hire them because they know what they're talking about because this is what they do as part of their day job. Because we are located well before COVID in the heart of New York City, we have a wide field to choose from. And now that we're virtual, we can have faculty from anywhere around the world. Great. Uh, I, have, I have a couple of questions for Father Garanzini. Uh, so, uh, and I'm just gonna kind of put it uh, together. So what, uh, uh, there was a question about, uh, you did mention, uh, you know, the changing values in the Z generation, but, uh, you know, there was a question about, you know, how do you explain uh, the high support for uh, uh, leaders like, like Trump, who, uh, you know, e even after they have failed miserably in dealing with uh, crisis situations like uh, COVID-19. And then um, there was kind of a faculty member mentioned that, uh, you know, that they hope that these core concerns would have been uh, those of the students, but they don't see that. Uh, they, you know, uh, their experience has been trying to convince them of some of these things rather than walking with them as they search for answers. And so uh, they don't see, uh, what, you, what you were sharing about uh, that the students have these, that have these hungers and they're looking for uh, us faculty to walk with them. I I, um, I think you know the an educator starts out with the assumption I think uh, Stuart said it really well that they want to lead a purposeful life and that uh, there's there's a lot of noise around them political noise um, especially that uh, can be very disorienting and and lead you to think that the uh, the, the goose that's laying the golden egg is is on the next farm and that's not right here something that you can help create I think they I think students do have these deep concerns and it it amounts to in them a desire to uh, find meaning and find purpose so uh, I don't I don't I don't assume that someone goes to college and is going to probably keep their political leanings towards Trumpism. In fact, in fact I think uh, people, with, people with a college education are not voting for Trump. Uh, so we already know that. So, um, but, but so I, I have a lot of hope in this next generation and I think they want a hope-filled future and it's our job to help them imagine that. Um, I think Augusto talked about the role of imagination and I think that's incumbent on every educator. How do you, in fact, imagine a world that's better, more fair, uh, more just? And how do you help them imagine that world? So uh, I think that's a challenge in every age, but it's, it's gonna be a particular challenge for us going forward. If I can take a crack at that. Young people didn't vote for Trump. Overwhelmingly, they voted for Hillary. Why did we get Trump? One, because he appealed to the about third of 
people in the United States who are overtly racist. We thought they had gone away. We, they just crawled under a rock and came happily out again. And this is a challenge that we really have to tackle. And I'm hopeful that the current Black Lives Matter interest is tackling that. At Bard, we talk specifically about this. We, it's part of my class. But Hillary lost because her campaign manager, John Podesta, is guilty of political malpractice. He abandoned the upper Midwest. He said, we're going to win Utah. We're going to win Arizona. No, you're not. And you didn't. And Steve Bannon is very smart. Steve Bannon said, if we can take the upper Midwest, we can take the Electoral College. Trump lost. He lost the popular vote. But we have this anachronism in the United States of the Electoral College. And Bannon targeted that exactly. Podesta blew it. You can't fix stupid. I don't think Biden will make that mistake. Thanks. Uh, so I see. I see that we are we are kind of uh, out of time. But I do. I do want to. Uh, so there was a there was a reference to the economy of uh, Francesco, and this was really uh, you know a, a, a conference that Pope Francis had put together to get uh, young uh, entrepreneurs and economists to imagine a different kind of economy. And so, Father Guernsey, I don't know whether you you want to you want to say something about it. it. Was supposed to be held in Assisi in March. I know kind of many of us on the call over here have been kind of also engaged a little bit with it. But if you can share a little bit about the economy of Francesco, because it ties in with this effort. Well, you know, I think uh, the Pope, this Pope has been one of the few international leaders that has any credibility that can call people together. And I think he's used that power extremely well. Um, he happens to be concerned about the very things I think many young people are concerned about as well. So um, I'm hopeful that in the future there'll be a, a, that meeting of economists. Uh, again, it's simply to keep the spotlight, it's to stoke the imagination, it's to get people uh, talking, and nobody else is doing that. There's, there's no other place that's, that's trying to pull people together as a as opposed to hunker down and pull them apart. So um, I'm hopeful that, you know, when gatherings, large gatherings are, are uh, possible again, that, that that gets back on the agenda. And I, I suspect it will. As long as this Pope's around, uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, limit to his energy and his enthusiasm and his courage, so. Great, on that, on that note, let's give a round of applause to our uh, panelists in whatever way you can. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to take a little break and uh, be back in about 28 minutes for the Dean's panel. I know, David, do you want to say anything about uh, the Dean's panel? David Marigo? You're muted. David, you're muted. David, you're muted. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> well, the Dean's panel will begin in half an hour and we uh, already coordinate with all Phillips, who will moderate this part of the session. No? Send you and we uh, welcome to this uh, panel at 11 a.m. Thank so it's the, same, it's, it's the same Zoom link. Uh, we'll see you all in, you know, take a little break and uh, we'll see you all in a little while. Bye. Bye-bye. See you.